everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us um, for another installment of our NSBP Innovate Seminar Series Talk. Um, this series, um, it was planned and created by the National Society of Black Physicists Student Council as a way and a forum for our members to come together and be able to share their research ideas in a non-specialist way, as well as for members to get to engage with other members' research. And so we are very excited that this series has been so fruitful and so many members have been enjoying these series. So thank you for coming and please continue to join us every month for our series. Um, this series is hosted by KITP. So thank you to everyone at KITP for hosting this series as well. Um, and so I am Farah Simpson, the student representative of the board of the National Society of Black Physicists. And today we will be having a talk by Kiara Wilk. And Kiara is a first year PhD student at Brown University in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. Prior to her graduate studies, Kiara received her Bachelor of Science in Geology with a minor in Astrobiology from RPI. And so Kiara will be talking to us today about geological mapping of resurfacing features on Europa. So we're very excited to have her. Just a few logistics for the actual talk. So we save all questions for the end. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to type them in the Q&A box during the talk, but we will hold all questions until the end of the talk. So thank you again. And Kiara, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, you can take it away now. All right, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going, I will turn off my camera just for bandwidth uh, issues, but um, yeah, so uh, my name is Kiara Wilk. I'm a first year PhD student at Brown University in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. And I'm really excited to share with you guys all today, a project that I was working on last summer, um, doing some geologic mapping of resurfacing features on Europa. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to give a special thanks and shout out to Dr. Lene Quick, who's at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and Dr. Emily Martin, who's with the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, for collaborating with me on this project and for all the help that they've given me along the way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when you hear the word volcano, you probably have something that comes to mind. Perhaps you think about the volcanoes in Hawaii or the deadly eruption of Mount Vesuvius. But no matter what comes to mind first, it's likely that when you hear the word volcano, you're picturing traditional volcanism. And if I were to just Google what is volcanism, you'd get something along the lines of volcanism is the eruption or discharge of molten rock onto the surface. And we know, certainly know that there's volcanism here on Earth. We can see it. Uh, but there's also evidence of volcanism on places such as Mars, Mercury, Venus, and Io as well. These volcanic eruptions can be categorized as one of two ways. They can either be effusive or they can be explosive. So an example of effusive volcanism would be the Hawaiian eruptions. Effusive eruptions are characterized by having mafic lavas, so they tend to produce things such as basalts. These magmas are gonna be rich in things like iron and magnesium, but they'll also have less than 55 weak percent of silica. The eruption temperatures tend to be quite high. They're usually above 1000 degrees Kelvin, which translates to roughly 730 degrees Celsius. And they also have a really low volatile content. So there's not a lot of gases present. There's a low viscosity. So the lava moves pretty freely. It's not that resistant to flow. On the other hand, however, we have explosive volcanism. So these explosive eruptions will have felsic lavas, so they're more likely to produce things such as rhyolite. And the magma is going to be rich in things such as aluminum, potassium, sodium, and calcium. And it will have greater than 55 weight percent of silica. These eruption temperatures tend to be a lot lower uh, than that we see with effusive volcanism. So they're usually less than 1,000 degrees Kelvin, which again is right around 730 degrees Celsius. And they, unlike our effusive eruptions, they're gonna have a really high volatile content and they're gonna be very viscous. 
And so it's the combination of them having a lot of gases and being very thick that makes these eruptions so explosive. Um, and so these, this is kind of what we would consider to be a traditional uh, type of volcanism. But there's also cryovolcanism, uh, which very similarly, uh, or is similar um, in some sense to traditional volcanism. And it's been occurring or has occurred on some of the icy moons and dwarf planets in our solar system. And so these include places such as Triton, Enceladus, Pluto, and Europa, just to name a few. So cryovolcanism is the eruption of aqueous solutions that would otherwise be frozen on the surface of the icy moon or dwarf planets um, in our solar system. And just like traditional volcanism, we're still gonna have both of our effusive and explosive uh, eruptions. So effusive cryovolcanism is gonna entail surface flows of really cold aqueous solutions or slush onto, the, um, onto your planetary body. Whereas explosive cryovolcanism is going to be more venting of water vapors, salts, and ice crystals, and these geyser-like plumes onto the surface. Um, and on the right is just an artist's rendition of what uh, an explosive cryovolcanic event might look like. Um, and I do think they did a really great job. It's quite, quite nice uh, illustration. But you might be thinking, well, okay. How exactly are these cryolavas a liquid or a slush if they're supposed to be frozen? Um, and that's a good question, right? So as these cryomagmas are delivered to the surface, uh, the pressure is going to change. And that pressure should, like, that releasing pressure should cause the cryomagmas to freeze. And so if you look at our pressure temperature diagram of water, um, and we're kind of at like, you know, we're, it's cold. These cryomagmas uh, can range from anywhere from 70 degrees Kelvin to 273 degrees Kelvin. Um, and we're below the surface. So the pressure is going to be higher, or at least relatively higher than that at the surface. As we move down, we're going to release pressure. Temperature will stay roughly the same. Um, but eventually, we're going to cross this threshold where no longer is water going to be the stable phase. It's going to want to be ice. But we know that these cryomagmas are coming out as a liquid or they're coming out as a slush. They're not freezing um, on their journey to the surface. And this is because the cryomagmas aren't just water. Um, they're actually super, super salty. And so the salts act as a freezing point um, depressant uh, as they move from the interior to the surface of the icy moon or the dwarf planet. And this is very similar to how rock salt or, you know, um, just salt in general is used to prevent freezing on roads. Uh, the Northeast recently just received two feet of snow. Uh, and so you can definitely bet that there was salt everywhere in attempt to kind of lower uh, that freezing point. So it's very similar with what we're seeing with the cryomagmas um, involved in cryovolcanism. Um, so that was kind of just a brief intro into cryovolcanism, but today I want to focus specifically on cryovolcanism on Europa. Uh, so Europa is quite small. Um, it's about 3,100 kilometers in diameter, which puts it at 90% the size of our moon. Uh, and it's only about 25% the size of Earth, which has a diameter of roughly 12,700. Uh, kilometers. But despite Europa being so small, it can still pack a big punch. Uh, Europa has a subsurface ocean with a volume of about 3 billion cubic kilometers um, compared to Earth, which is four times as big uh, and has a ocean volume of 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. So this is super fascinating because Europa is so small but has an ocean that is up to twice the size of Earth's and we know that Earth's ocean is able to host a variety of life forms. It's a very habitable environment. And Europa has twice as much uh, potentially of a habitable world out there. Um, and so a lot of people get really excited when thinking about Europa and specifically Europa's subsurface. But just generally, Europa is one of four Galilean moons that are orbiting Jupiter. Um, so it is an icy moon. Its average surface temperature is roughly 100 degrees Kelvin, so it is quite cold. Um, and the structure of Europa consists of an iron core, followed by a rocky uh, silicate mantle. And then it has this liquid ocean 
uh, again, which is about holds a volume of about three billion cubic kilometers of liquid, um, and it's roughly 100 kilometers thick. And then this is all encased in an ice shell that ranges anywhere in thickness from, from three to 30 kilometers. There's evidence suggesting that Europa is currently geologically active. And then maybe the only other body in our solar system that has plate tectonics, which is super interesting. Um, and crater counts suggest that the surface of Europa appears to be no older than 60 million years old, which is actually quite young. Um, but we know that Europa must be older than 60 million years old. Um, and so there has to be some sort of process that is causing alteration of the surface, is delivering new material that is creating these, this appearance of uh, Europa being younger uh, than it actually is. And so it's likely that cryovolcanism has played a role in the resurfacing history of or resurfacing of Europa within its recent geologic history. And this is because all across Europa, there are these dome features on the surface that have been identified. And some people believe that they may be cryovolcanic in origin, and others have modeled them as these viscous effusions of cryolava. Um, and so there are a couple of different ways that we could get these cryovolcanic domes uh, to the surface of Europa. And I have a figure uh, here that kind of illustrates how this process would happen. So again, Europa has this thick ice shell. Um, and if we look kind of at the first two images, part A of the figure, one way we could create these domes would be if within our ice shell, we have these briny pockets or like these lakes almost of uh, fluids within our ice shell. If these fluid reservoirs experience a pressure change, it can cause the fluid to want to move upward uh, and consequently create these fluid effusions onto the surface that would create our cryovolcanic domes. The pressure change could be due to a couple of different reasons. On the left, the illustration is showing a pressure change due to tidal forces. And on the right, it's illustrating a pressure change due to partial freezing of the fluid reservoir, which um, would minimize the volume uh, and consequently cause the pressure to go up, creating the domical feature. On the bottom, um, another way it illustrates that you could create these domes would be if there is a conduit um, or a fracture that extends all the way from the surface of Europa uh, down to the subsurface ocean, which would just act as kind of a means for uh, the, the interior of the ocean to come up and extrude and create these effusions of the um, fluid onto the surface. So we know that we have these dome features on Europa, uh, we see them, they might be due to cryovolcanic activity. So the question then becomes, can the spatial distributions of these potential cryolava domes tell us anything about Europa? And the answer is hopefully yes. Um, if we can pinpoint the spatial distribution and geologic context of these cryovolcanic features, uh, they may be able to provide some insights into the resurfacing history of Europa, the rheology of cryolavas, uh, that are being delivered to the surface and the internal structure of the icy moon. So you could hopefully get some more information about these fluid reservoirs that are causing these domes to form. But before we can do any of that, uh, really the first step is just to figure out where they are and then to map them. Currently, there is no dedicated database that contains the locations, geologic context, and characteristics of these domes. And so that's what the work that I um, have done and I'm share, gonna share with you guys today has started to do. Because once we have all the data in one place, we know what these domes look like, we know where they are, we can start answering some of these bigger picture questions. And so what we were doing was we wanted to look at the domes on Europa and we wanted to see if there were any domes that looked like they may have formed due to cryovolcanic activity, specifically domes that may have formed via axisymmetric flow of viscous fluids onto the surface. So these domes would have been characterized by having or being distinct from their surroundings and having relatively smooth surfaces. And this is because if you already have the surface of Europa, it's going to look how it wants to look. Um, that, you know, it's all set in stone, so to speak. 
But once you start delivering the cryo magmas to the surface and you're creating these dome-like features, the surface should, or you're having these viscous effusions onto the surface and that effusion should be relatively smooth. Um, and the dome itself should look different than what's already there because it's, it's been added to the surface. And so what this means is when we were going through, uh, we we're trying to pick out what that would look like in terms of um, these dome-like features. And so I have examples here on the bottom, just outlining, um, you know, we see these different types of domes on Europa. Would we consider them part of our study? So in box A, we have this dome feature. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you can, I am kind of circling it here. Um, and you will notice that it is distinct from its surrounding and the surface is relatively smooth. And so we consider this dome to have potentially formed through axisymmetric flow of these vis viscous fluids onto the surface. In box B, we have one, two, three domes um, that are present in this image. Again, they are all distinct from their surroundings and they have relatively smooth surfaces. And so we would consider these domes to potentially form due to an effusion of these fluids onto the surface. And in box C, we see that we have this domical feature. Uh, topography profiles indicate that it is in fact a dome feature or has like this dome-like profile. Um, and the surface is relatively smooth, but the background is not, or the dome is not distinct from its surroundings. It actually mimics the surrounding terrain. Um, and while it is a dome, we wouldn't consider it to have formed through cryovolcanism. It may have formed through some other process such as diapherism. So it's more, it looks like it might be more of like a punched up feature. There's something in the subsurface that is causing the, the surface to deform, uh, but it wasn't due to a cryovolcanic eruption. And so we would not consider this um, to be one of the domes that we're interested in for our study. So we were able to go through and map and identify 226 domes in the leading hemisphere, trailing hemisphere, and the Connemara region of Europa. All of the locations of the domes that we were able to identify are indicated in the, as the pink dots. And so again, we were really interested in not only where these domes are, but what they look like. So after going through, I was able to characterize the dome morphologies as either being rounded, lobate, or irregular. So rounded, the rounded dome morphologies uh, were classified by their generally smooth curved surfaces without the presence of lobes. Um, so they're pretty boring in the sense that they're just, they're round. Uh, there's no other way to put that. Uh, but what you're seeing here is I have uh, the unmapped image on the left, and then on the right, I have my mapped interpretation. So you can try and see if you believe me, like, yes, there is a dome here. Um, and then potentially if you agree with my mapped interpretation. But again, um, the examples I'm showing you here are just kind of domes that I picked out that we classified as being rounded, um, but there's nothing, nothing really special about them. They're just round. <laughs> the second morphology were these globate domes, and these were classified by having one or more curved or rounded projection. Um, and so again, um, for the most part, they're round, but there's something stick, you know, part of the dome is sticking off. Uh, and so they couldn't classify them as rounded. And so we made this new category of them being considered low bait. And of course, because Valentine's Day is right around the corner, I had to include um, an example of what I think looks like a heart uh, shaped dome for you all. And then finally, the last dome morphology were these irregular domes. And these were classified by having one or more polygonal projection or just being polygonal in shape overall. Uh, so these domes were kind of the leftover domes. They fit our definition of being having a relatively smooth surface and being distinct from their like the background or the surrounding terrain, but they weren't rounded and they weren't lobate. Uh, and so we concluded them as these uh, irregular dome morphologies. So of the 226 domes, 159 of these domes were considered to be rounded, which was the most prevalent morphology of the three, followed by the 54 lobate domes, 
and the 13 irregular domes being the least common dome morphology. Uh, while you can typically find all of the rounded dome morphologies or all of the dome morphologies across Europa, um, or rounded ones, I'm sorry, while you can find the rounded dome morphologies all across Europa, the lobate dome morphologies tend to be in the northern hemisphere, we notice. Um, so the rounded ones are the purple dots and the lobate domes are the orange dots. Uh, the hemi like kind of if you cut the image in half, uh, that would be where like north and south um, is, uh, and most of the lobate domes do fall in the northern hemisphere. I could not tell you why, but it was something that we noticed as we were going through and mapping them. So we also wanted to consider the geologic context for these domes as well. I think it's really important not, you know, we know where they are, we know what they look like, but is there anything else that the kind of local geology might be able to tell us or the context and what they formed might be able to tell us um, and help help us later on when we're trying to model these stones or trying to figure out you know how long it took them to form or um, those those sorts of things and so there are a couple of contexts that were particularly interesting and then I'll walk through with you guys um, and those were the domes that had twins domes that were cut by a ridge domes that intersect a ridge, and then domes that were in a depression. So domes that were cut by a ridge have just, they have a ridge going through them. And this tells us that the dome had to form first, and then the ridge formation followed. So if we look at the image in the top left, uh, very clearly we can see that, you know, there is our dome here. It looks un rather undisturbed, like the formation was not influenced um, by the presence of the ridge that was going through it. So ridge came first, it hardened, it settled, and then the ridge had to form afterwards. Uh, but we also have these domes that tell us a different story. So these are domes that intersect a ridge. And so in this case, the dome formation, the ridge formation came first and the dome formation was emphased on top of it. And so this is, it's really interesting because going through this, I was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. Some of these domes have ridges going through them. And then I was like, oh, wait, well, some of these domes are on top of ridges. Um, so it kind of has this interesting dichotomy of, of which came first. Um, and in each scenario, you know, one tells us one thing came first and another scenario tells us another thing came first. We also found that there were some domes that were in very close proximity to another dome, um, or they were just like bordered another dome. And so these domes were considered to have a twin. And then select domes were found to be in a depression. Um, and so I wish I had included the transects for everyone to see. Um, so you'll have to take my word for this one. Um, but when you look at the topographic profile of these domes, uh, what we find is that we have our dome uh, kind of looking further away from our dome. You'll see that there uh, is a change in elevation. Um, so you have your depression followed by your dome formation, again, depression on the other side, and then the topography kind of the elevation increases. Uh, and the same could be said for the uh, dome that's shown on the right. So you have this kind of decrease in elevation. Um, so you have your depression followed by your dome formation um, and then uh, kind of your depression on the other side. So of the uh, 226 domes that we mapped um, and we're trying to consider their geologic context, uh, they're particularly interesting. We found that five, there are five twin pairs uh, so there are 10 domes in total um, that were really close to each other. There are 15 domes that were cut by a ridge. Uh, there are 45 domes that intersected a ridge. And then there are six domes that were in a depression. Uh, and again, I just wanted to highlight kind of, you know, when doing this, that at first it's like, okay, well, I mapped them. Here's where they are. This is what they look like. Uh, but then I was like, well, is there anything interesting about them? And I think the most interesting thing about looking at the geologic context was just, you know, we have these domes that were cut by ridges and domes that intersect ridges. And it's really interesting because we find some of these domes right next to each other. 
um, in the Connemara region, the leading hemisphere and the trailing hemisphere. Uh, there are examples where you have a dome that was cut by a ridge and a dome that intersects a ridge side by side. Um, and this tells us, or will help tell us, um, a kind of about the relative timing of when things formed. Um, so if we know that one feature, you know, formed at a certain time or before uh, the dome had formed, that's like not too far away from it, we can start figuring out um, kind of the relative aging and history of how things had to have resurfaced on Europa, which I think is super important and we wouldn't have found um, if we didn't go through and do this. So you might be thinking, okay, well, we've mapped these domes and we've characterized them. So what? What's next? Well, we're working to publish a catalog of about 300 domes that we've found on the surface of Europa. And this catalog will include the location and physical characteristics of all of these potential cryovolcanic domes, which again is a super important because uh, to date, there is no published publicly available catalog um, that includes all of these dome formations that, that just are available um, for anyone. And so I think this will be a really important step in just making this information more accessible. Uh, and then hopefully it can be used to start answering some of these bigger questions that we had about what is the, you know, the real, rheology of the cryolavas? Can they tell us anything about the, comp the composition of them or the internal structure, those sort of things? Uh, so this is really a first step into kind of getting uh, to that place. Um, and so consequently, uh, we're going to hopefully soon start being able to link what's happening uh, on the surface to the subsurface. And so I mentioned earlier that there are, you know, potentially these brine pockets or fluid reservoirs uh, that are in the ice shell. And so trying to figure out what's happening, you know, what's causing these pressure changes that would create the dome that we're consequently seeing on the surface, uh, trying to figure out their chemistry, the composition, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also to just modeling how these domes are formed. So we see this feature on the surface. Uh, can we model that? Um, and can, can we model how these domes would have formed? Uh, and we did uh, have a publication that was submitted in December um, of last year. So hopefully relatively uh, soon, uh, that publication will be available. And while I'm not involved with the Europa Clipper mission, I do think that some of the most exciting work um, is yet to come. So Europa Clipper will be launching in 2024 and hopefully should arrive by 2030. And the real, the goal of Europa Clipper's mission is to conduct a detailed survey of the moon to determine whether the icy moon could harbor conditions um, that are suitable for life. And in the process of doing that, Europa Clipper is gonna make 50 distributed flybys over the course of about five years or so, uh, or yeah, for four years, sorry, uh, four years or so. Uh, and so we're gonna get a lot of data all across the icy moon, which is super, super exciting because of the 10 instrument payload that's on Europa Clipper, it's gonna include cameras and spectrometers that are gonna able to create these high resolution images and composition maps of the moon surface. Um, and just kind of for some context, uh, the images that we were looking at were like of medium-ish resolution. And so we're going to get really high resolution images, hopefully, out of this mission, um, which would have made my job so much easier when trying to map these domes and find these features. And sometimes you'd, I'd be sitting there and be like, oh, I wish I could just see this a little better. Um, or I wasn't quite sure if the dome was there because the resolution just wasn't you know, where it needed to be. Um, so hopefully as more data comes in in the future, we'll start to be able to identify more of these features. Um, but in addition to the cameras and spectrometers, there's also going to be ice penetrating radar, magnetometer, plasma sensors, gravity instruments, the whole nine yards uh, to reel, reel more about the moon's ocean and deep interior. There's going to be thermal cameras to see where warmer ice is located and areas where water might be erupting onto the surface, which will be really important when trying to learn more about uh, you know, cryovolcanism on Europa and whether or not it's currently uh, resurfacing the uh, resurfacing Europa today. Uh, and there will also be dust analyzers and mass spectrometers uh, to study the chemistry of particles in space um, near Europa as well. So with that, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for having me today. I know I'm not giving a physics S talk, but I hope you enjoyed learning um, kind of what I've been up to. Um, so thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them for you.
Thank you so much, Kira. That was an incredibly interesting talk. And, and beforehand, uh, uh, you told us you were a little bit worried going into this because you're more a geologist than a physicist. Don't worry about it. I'm studying math right now. Uh, so uh, uh, I understand how you feel, but like I was still hooked and interested in, in every single thing you were talking about. Um, so to kind of, yeah, to kind of stall for time a little bit for people to uh, put whatever questions they might have in the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions of my own. Yeah. Um, first of which being, what's, what's rheology? <laughs> Okay, yeah, so just kind of trying to figure out like how like the lava would have had to like moved and like deformed to get the the features that like we're seeing on the, the surface. So like how that deformation and such would have been uh, taking place. Cool, thank you. Uh, and we have uh, one question in the chat from Orenthal Tucker. Uh, what size distribution of domes did you find? Most pictures looked on the order of five kilometers. And I, I also had a question about that, just sort of what the size distribution uh, uh, like. Yeah, so I guess maybe a little embarrassing. So I actually did not, um, I was mapping them, but I didn't pay close attention to how, like the distribution in sizes, which, you know, now that I'm thinking, I probably should go back and do, because I think that might be quite interesting. Um, but yeah, going back, um, let's see. I think most of them were a lot, yeah. So most of them did range between like five and like 10 kilometers, I would say would be a common size because I do not remember having to change my scale bar quite often. Um, yes, so I'd say probably around five to 10 kilometers, um, but I could definitely get back to you um, with a more definite um, size distribution. Yes, and we have uh, uh, another question from, uh, Siebert, Siebert, don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, apologies, um, but uh, does Europa have an atmosphere? And if so, does that uh, one, impact observations from optical or radar imaging or two, plume formation? Okay, uh, yeah, so that's a great question. I'm gonna start my answer by saying I do, I'm not, I'm no Europa expert. Um, so I did this project um, as a summer internship um, this past summer, um, but I would imagine that, uh, so I guess I cannot say for certain, there probably might be someone in the chat that might be able to answer this for you, uh, what exactly the atmosphere looks like. Uh, usually when taking kind of images say from spacecraft data, um, there usually is some sort of interference because it's so icy, there might be, um, kind of some issues with the water causing some interference. Um, I mainly deal with spectroscopy, and so um, I'm I'm doing now, and so there usually is some sort of atmospheric issue. Uh, with radar, I don't know how that would influence um, what we're seeing, uh, but what I can tell you um, is that it's, we can, there have been instances where it's like, okay, we think we can actually see something erupting onto the surface, uh, so I don't think it's a huge, deal whereas like okay well like it's useless like we can't see plume um, formations happening at all um, so I, I hope that answers your question I know it's not a very concrete answer um, but if you want to email me um, I can try to get back to you um, my email is just going to be kira underscore wilk at brown edu thank you and we have a another question just now mm -hmm. uh, are they are there any age estimates or guesses at the age of the domes? Uh, do some domes appear younger than others, even if we don't know their exact ages? Uh, yeah, um, so at least from the work that I was doing, I think you can definitely start to hint at there might be like the relative ages of things. So you can't say for certain that, you know, this dome is younger than this dome. Um, based on just what we're seeing. Um, but I think it's really interesting because there were some cases where you might have, if you have a ridge formation, like a long ridge formation, um, but there's a dome on one end that is, has the ridge intersecting it. And then on the other end of that ridge formation, there's a dome on top. You can at least say that the dome that, you know, is in, 
has a ridge intersecting it is going to be younger um, than the dome that's further down that is in place on top of that same ridge formation. Um, so that kind of starts hinting at, okay, yeah, you can say relatively like this dome might be younger than this dome, um, but it won't tell us whether a dome on the other side of Europa um, is younger or older. Um, so you can start to kind of pick out relative ages, uh, but I know that's an area that a lot of people are, gonna, are starting to work on is trying to figure out like, okay, well, how long do these domes take to form? Um, and then based on what we know um, about how other features on Europa are forming and, and when they formed, um, can we start figuring out like how old they must be? Are these domes maybe? All right, we have a, another question from Janie Levin. Uh, do we know what processes form the ridges? Okay. Uh, thank you, Janie, for the question. So I do not know at the moment what processes cause these ridges on Europa. Um, so I could get back to you on that. Um, but the Connemara region, it's very chaotic. <laughs> um, it's the Connemara chaos region. And there are a lot of these dome or a lot of these ridge formations, and you see it all over um, Europa. So I'm sure there is someone out there who has some thoughts on how these domes have formed, um, and I can get back to you um, on that as well. So I wish I had a, a more satisfying answer. <laughs> cool, thank you. And uh, I don't see any more questions uh, yet in uh, the Q and A in the chat, but I did I did have one last question, which is is there some kind of like crosstalk between people who you know study uh, uh, cryovolcanism yeah. in Europa and people who study geysers on Earth. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of subtleties to be had in, in the differences, but they naively would seem fairly similar. Uh, yeah, so I definitely, yes, I, I think the answer would definitely probably be yes. Um, I think even with just like volcanism in general, like figuring out, okay, you know, we have some sort of, and, and this is for any kind of planetary, I think, process. Um, we, you know, we have it on Earth, and there's something kind of similar like that process on another planet. Um, so kind of understanding how this happens in an environment that we might have more control over and might be able to kind of study a little bit better um, is always useful in trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we model this on another planet where we can't exactly go see and we have really limited data on? Um, and so, yeah, I would definitely would imagine that there is a lot of crossover and talk um, when trying to figure out like, okay, well, how exactly might this be happening? Uh, what type of, you know, on earth, you know, uh, an environment that we might understand a little bit better, um, you know, what, what allows it to happen? And then how can we kind of take that information and then transform it to what we're seeing and applying it to the situation on Europa? Cool, thank you so much. Oh, and we have, uh... Another question from Stephen. Uh, is there any effect of Jupiter on Europa's eruptions and tectonic activity? I wish I put this slide in here. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so because, so Jupiter, so Europa does experience a lot of like tidal work or like tidal heating um, from Jupiter. And so that definitely like supplies energy um, kind of to the equation um, in that sense. Um, whether like, Specifically, how that affects the like cryovolcanic activity, um, I'm not 100% certain on. Um, although I do imagine that might have some effect on like kind of the you know pressure changes, especially like um, with tidal tidal forces from like the subsurface ocean that might be causing uh, these eruptions um, to like cause the fluids to go up. So uh, yeah, there is definitely effect. Um, or at least I would think that there would be effect from the tidal uh, forces from Jupiter. Thank you so much. And I think uh, that is the last question, uh, at least for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, uh, we, yeah. we, yeah, we try to uh, uh, organize an NSBP Innovate Seminar Series uh, every single month. So I thank everyone for joining us for the first one of the year um, and in Black History Month for uh, no less. Um, and thank you so much, Kira, for again, a talk that is in a field we're probably not 
all completely familiar with, but nonetheless was incredibly interesting. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.